We are about to meet a man who is, without doubt, the most famous, the most accomplished dancer, male dancer, performing today. His leaps are legion. His fan base is enormous. And as far as I'm concerned in performance, he never disappoints. Please welcome Carlos Acosta. Now, probably a lot of the things you've said are going to come back and haunt you tonight, Carlos. We'll start right up to date, because your most recent experience is choreographing Don Quixote. What did you learn from that experience? I know you've choreographed before, you did Tocororo, but with Don Quixote, what did you learn from that? Well, I learned that it's very hard to choreograph and dance at the same time. That's something that... You, nobody should do, you know, <laughs> especially three at Bali. I learned that, you know, we need more time, especially, you know, a ballet like that, but it's not still ready. Uh, it's not like I conceived it. You know, it's a work in progress. Like when we say, even Macmillan, where he created Manon and things like that, you see it from a front and then you realize, oh, that is not working or it's a little bit slow and they adjust, and then the next time around, maybe they light it better, and so it's a work in progress until finally you get the definitive version. Don Quixote has been put on twice before by the Royal Ballet, neither time particularly successfully, which tends to be quite intimidating when you come to stage a new performance. How intimidated were you? How nervous were you about getting it right? And how did you approach it to get it right? What did you want to do that hadn't been done before? And I tried to study every production of Don Quixote that has ever made, has been ever made, uh, with a critical eye, and I tried to to see what is lacking and things. And where can I bring something, freshness, something uh, of today? Because I realized that these classics, ballet, they've been created so long ago. And what was funny then doesn't mean that it's funny now, you know? So it's how you sort of get that feel of what it was then and try to make it more accessible to people so f people have a, a, a stronger connection. And oftentimes when you see all the productions of Don Q, all you see is Basilio and Kitri flying all over the place and, and you're almost waiting for that fact and you, you actually don't care about the journey of Don Q. You hardly even seen Don, Don Quixote. The other thing also that I try to adjust is the second act. It tends to be a very boring act. Where... It's quite different from the other two. It's like going into a classical ballet in the middle, isn't it really? Exactly, but this is the act that everybody say, okay, time to go and have a drink outside because <laughs> there's nothing going on here, you know? So I had that idea to bring the flamenco players and make this kind of uh, dynamic dialogue as well. And it's a bit entertaining with this gypsy doing their thing, but at the same time, uh, you have this developing of Don Q's madness with the windmill where he thinks these are giants are attacking us and things. So you had these dialogues at the same time and that to me make it more uh, interesting. Let's go back to the very beginning to Havana, Cuba, 1973. Carlos Acosta is born, the last of 11 children, junior. <laughs> Earliest memory? You know, uh, my apartment used to feel huge at the time, but of course I was five or something, you know? And, uh, and at the end, I realized I was really, really tiny, <laughs> you know, when I began growing. But uh, I remember we always had this problem with the beds, you know, the beds and how to feed everybody in one room. And so the beds uh, had always, my father, you know, he fight for every penny. So you ask him for something, he, you really had to ask him and beg him because he would never give you, you know, more than the necessary. 
And so for that time, sometimes, you know, we went on months and years without fixing this bed, you know, and the bed had these, these springs yeah. sticking out. It was just a really terrible exercise to sleep in that bed because, you know, you got uh, the three of us, you know, my sister, and then my other sister that way with the feet this way. And then you, you know, you sort of locate, uh, we knew where the, the strings were. There was number two, number five. You know, you move that way, number, number, number six is gonna be right here waiting for you. So it's, it's that's a, a really good memory. You played truant endlessly. You went off and played football. You were terribly naughty. You were, well, you were a classic naughty boy. What is the moment that light bulb moment when you thought, I really want to be a ballet dancer? I saw uh, the National Ballet of Cuba perform in Pinal del Rio because they, they sort of kicked me out from the school in Havana. And then I ended up board in a board school in Pinal del Rio. Uh, and then while I was there, I saw the National Ballet of Cuba came to, to that town. I remember the guy who I saw was, you know, was had this ability to leap very, 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 you know, very high. And then I remember even the ballet that he was uh, dancing was a fe flower festival in Hensano, which is a Bournonville style that always keep the, the arms down. And, and so really powerful leaps. And for that point, I, I saw, wow, this is wonderful. I want to be able to jump like that and to be able to lift the, the women with one hand. <laughs> Did that mean that from that moment on, you then applied yourself, you then concentrated? How competitive were you, are you? I think it's wrong to compete with somebody else. I think it's wrong, it's, it, what is important is to compete with yourself. I always compete with myself and be the best I could be. Meaning, if I do three periods today, I'm gonna do the best I can so that I can do four tomorrow. And yeah, you, you use everybody else to stimulate you and also to give you a sense of the place that you are in the contest. But I think when you compete and this and that, I think you once you be compete to enhance one's skills and abilities. And that's how I always won. I didn't compete to excel, to become the best of the world, to have a crown and to have these titles. All I wanted is to be better myself. I know that I was using my time wisely. And to me, the most rewarding thing is just that my teacher, you know, we come and say, wow, that, that looks great, which she never did. <laughs> it was very, very hard for her to say that. When, when she go, she came to you and say, that's all right. You knew that it was really, really good. Your father continued to be, to be strict with you and to, to make sure that you were doing it, but what, what drove you to keep doing it? Was it the exhilaration that you discovered in it? What intrinsically in ballet made you want to do it well? The athleticism uh, part, because you know I like football. I like. Uh, I always was restless. Uh, I like the physical, the sport aspects of things, and you know baseball and things like that. You know, I all to that point, all I knew was I got fired from the school. I had a bad reputation. And, uh, but with ballet, you know, I could change that. And I knew that I was dancing. When I was dancing, I saw that I see the girls looking and things. They said, oh, this is not that bad. I told you I was going to say things that you'd said that come back to haunt you. Talking of audiences, you said, I learned how to cheat the audience. What does that mean? Because nobody here would believe that you've ever cheated them out of anything. No, cheat, cheat is it's basically when you, you like if you have a headache or you have some knee pain, we, need, we deal with pain all the time. But you know, sometimes you're doing one leg and you, you still have to do the show. So how do you deal with that? So, you, know, it's, you, you learn to project and try to detract, detract the attention from what is hurting you. Look at my arms, my legs aren't moving. Right? And, <laughs> and, and seeing sometimes, uh, I mean, people who actually know your coach might be aware of that but people don't necessarily will know, you know, that I cut a double tour out or if I did this, I did this instead of that jump because of the performance and the energy is the most important. So you focus on that and give them the, the story and the energy and try to make it easy on your knees if their knee hurts at that time. So this kind of, but only with experience you, 
you uh, sort of um, get there. Tamara and I, we've been uh, performing for a social long time to the point that we grew and grew and grew and be, you know, uh, we'll be able to form this partnership. Uh, it's really great, she's very, very clever, uh, the fact that we both speak the same language as well and, and the way, that, the commitment that we both had towards make it real and believable. And I think it's great because I know exactly where her weight is, you know, you get this. I'm, I'm sure we haven't danced in a long time, but I'm sure if we, if we just put the shoes on and say, let's do this now, the memory. You Second know, nature. Just... Uh, your early years apart, and then you had this road to Damascus moment where you realized ballet was the thing. You've since been very critical of young dancers who lack discipline. The thing about discipline in life is, is everything, you know, and it is also come from home. Respect your, your family, respect your, your father, respect the oldest that came before you. It's such a beautiful thing to respect, you know? And, uh, and I learned that very well uh, through the school. And I learned to get there through hardship instead of just being famous and, you know, wanted to dance for money or wanted to dance to be famous or wanted to that no, to love what we do. And whatever that take you, whatever that take you, but don't do it for a, a destination. So this is very important. A lot of people now, you know, want to be famous, I want to be in TV, I want to be, you know, I want, want to become, you know? And, uh, and there is, a, they, but there is a process to, to get there that they sometimes overlooked. And that process is very, very important. We, we saw Manon there with Kenneth McMillan's ballets. It's clearly something about them. You're talking about fits. Um, with Macmillan choreography that fits you, tell us a bit about that. Uh, Macmillan is, well, no question, it's a genius. It's, it's, you know, it's, it took the ballet feather and make it darker, more believable, and introduced so many new stories. You know, people go and say, oh, I'm going to do my own choreography of Swan Lake. But there are so many versions of Swan Lake, but Macmillan, like Manon, there were no ballets before that, and it's the only the only ballet in the world that exists uh, that is called Manon because of Macmillan, and he did the same. You know, m many of these masterpieces. So it was no coincidence coincidence that he, you know, that he was just really, really a wonderful talent. Today. Let's go away. How do you think it can stay relevant? Do you think it still is relevant? I think ballet will never die, that's for sure. 
And ballets, they go to a phase that they become dormant and waiting for all the dancers to awake them. And sometimes it could be a cycle. But I think the ballets are there. They are wonderful, you know, wonderful art pieces. But at the same time, I think today, um, we, need, we also have a responsibility to stretch, you know, our art form more, further. And I think we can do it, because if Diagle did it then, you know, in the early 1900s, 1800s, if Diagle did it then, launching the career of all these people, I think now we got, it, these things are even more possible. The thing is that less people are, are uh, likely to collaborate. Like before, you know, you got the collaboration with Cocteau, Picasso, and Stravinsky. All these people were coming, you know, together to create wonderful pieces of art. To, now, a day, you do have, um, you know, cases that you do the, this sort of thing. Uh, and here, I think, uh, in London, which I think to me is the mecca of the art in the world, you know, you, you're still doing that. But the thing is that sometimes um, we have been limited ourselves for, for pieces that are like 20 minutes long, half an hour. You don't do a whole theme stories or theme that are impacted today and that give us a voice. So my thanks to you for sitting here and being interrogated. It's been a great delight. Please show your appreciation. Oh, thank you.